Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Heredia Conde and I am with the Center for Sensor Systems at the University of Siegen in Germany. And today I'm going to present our work on a trimodal time of flight camera, uh, which actually you can see behind. Uh, what you see actually is a, a live demonstrator for which we have a dedicated three, three minutes video, so please don't miss it. And now I'm going to share my screen with you and start my presentation. So this work has been carried out in cooperation with uh, PMD Technologies AG, which is a company also based here in Siegen. And we are presenting a camera that is able to deliver near infrared depth and material images in real time. So first of all, we are going to start with an introduction. Later, we will present the, the fundamentals on top of which we base our approach. And later, we will explain how we gain this ability for material classification from time of flight data, and we will wrap up with some conclusions. So, actually, if I present you these two images, which are RGB images, and I ask you to perform some material segmentation and classification, if you are an excellent classifier, you will come up with something like this, which looks like very good. But is this actually correct? Well, it really depends, right? Uh, because it looks very correct, but maybe it is completely wrong. So consider these two cases in which this was cropped from a billboard or this was cropped from a truck, uh, then the material will be completely wrong because here will be plastic, here will be metal probably. So actually relying only on RGB texture can lead to a catastrophic failure. Uh, and therefore we actually need to see material properties and not only RGB texture in order to perform a good material classification. And now the question is how we can uh, put time of flight uh, sensors into the game. Time of flight sensors or cameras in this case are actually active sensors, so they emit light to the scene and they are able to estimate uh, the distances between the camera and each scene point. And typically they emit near infrared light and unlike conventional pixels, they are endowed with demodulation capabilities. So it means that at each pixel, the integration process is uh, controlled by a demodulation signal. And depending on uh, the shape of the modulation and demodulation waveforms, uh, we can classify these time of flight systems in continuous wave uh, time of flight or pulse time of flight systems. In this work, we will consider exclusively continuous wave uh, TUF systems with close to sinusoidal modulation. So something like this. So the time of flight camera actually will be able to retrieve the phase shift that the modulated light has undergone by going and coming back from the scene and from this shift we will compute that. What technologies are out there? Well, one of the most flexible and most developed technologies for it is the so-called photonic mixer device or PMD technology. Here we have a Selene module from PMD which is actually the one we will use in our work and as you can see, it's a very tiny module. And furthermore, due to the size, we have that the lens and the light emitter are very close to each other. So we see that the pixel pitch is only five micrometers and they offer a bandwidth up to 160 megabytes. How do they work? Well, uh, conceptually, you can imagine that you have two transparent photo gates on, on top, which are isolated from the substrate uh, by means of um, oxide, silicon oxide. Uh, and here you apply some difference of potential so that in the substrate you generate a gradient so that the photo generated carriers will be pushed or pulled towards one integration well or the other. And that's how you gain this modulation or in this case demodulation capability. So changing the phase shift between the modulation and the demodulation signals, uh, then you can acquire samples of the cross correlation function between what you are receiving at the pixel and what you have emitted. So typically we perform four shifts and therefore we acquire four samples of this cross correlation function. And from these four samples applying the so-called four phases algorithm, we can retrieve the amplitude and the phase shift. And from the shift, we obtain the depth. So in principle, when light reaches a material, any kind of material, it will undergo a series of scattering phenomena of different uh, magnitude. And at the end of the day, uh, the combined effect of all these scattering phenomena uh, will translate into some signature of the material, 
which in time domain we call the material impulse response function. So it means that if we probe the material with uh, an impulse of light, it will respond in that way. And uh, this will depend on a series of material parameters, P. Uh, in this case, P also contains extrinsic parameters, uh, like for example, distance uh, and, um, and the intensity of the illumination, etc. And the good part is that different materials exhibit relatively different MIRFs, uh, and therefore material classification based on this material IRFs um, becomes feasible. What we are going to do is to use time of flight sensors in order to extract Fourier uh, samples or Fourier coefficients of these MIRFs. So this is what we actually would expect when you have uh, a completely opaque material. So you would expect a, a very clean reflection, but what you actually have is something like this. All materials are, are rather rough in some extent. Uh, and then you will receive a sum over a certain manifold of uh, paths. So you have always some multipath up to certain degree. And eventually, if you have additionally subsurface scattering, this multipath becomes uh, more relevant, um, like for example, in materials like colloidal suspensions, like milk, or atomato, human skin, etc. So these materials will have a more elongated MIRF. So let's suppose that this MIRF is uh, well defined on a certain bandwidth. So we will suppose, and actually it is like this, they are band limited functions. Uh, the bandwidth we denoted as omega. And therefore, we can select any frequency omega k within this bandwidth omega and tune our time of flight camera so that we probe the MIRF uh, with this frequency. So this modulated light at that frequency will reach the surface of the material and will be affected by this uh, scattering effects. And at the end, we will receive some reflection, which is the convolution of what we have emitted and this MIRF. Later, at the pixel, we will uh, further convolve this signal with some demodulation or control signal, which is not more than a shifted version of the signal we have emitted, where the shift we control. And furthermore, uh, if we um, consider uh, this sensing model, we very easily see that these measurements are not more than samples of this uh, cross-correlation function. And from a sufficiently large number of samples, for example, uh, big Q, we can determine the phase and amplitude of the corresponding Fourier coefficient of the MIRF. Typically, Q, big Q is equal to 4, like in the four phases algorithm we just introduced. So now we have a problem, and is that uh, these Fourier coefficients and the MIRF we are sensing uh, are affected by also extrinsic parameters that depend on the scene. For example, the, the final reflectivity of the material outside and uh, also the distance from the material to the camera, they will influence the amplitude and the phase of these Fourier coefficients. So we need some sort of normalization. We do it by means of this equation of five, so in amplitude domain and in phase domain. And for this, we use some amplitude ref and uh, phi uh, ref, which are reference amplitude and, and uh, phase which we obtain from a multi-frequency depth estimation approach, which is in, in the literature. And uh, now uh, we realize that our measurements cannot be readily used as features uh, because actually this MIRF will largely depend on the observation angle. Uh, and we have completely ignored this up to which is this, uh, up to this time. And actually this dependency is well known and is the basis of other methods based on bidirectional texture function, BTF, or the BRDF, which are rather standard. So for now, we are blind to them, so we need to do something. Fortunately, we have that in our time of flight module, both the lens and the illumination system are very close to each other. So in the far field, the illumination observation angles more or less coincide. And therefore, uh, and additionally, sorry, depth images can be readily obtained from the time of flight raw data. So we additionally can compute the depth, uh, sorry, the normals uh, of our object. And the lens normals can be definitely pre-computed. So uh, we can extend uh, the feature vectors by, for example, the cosine of the angle between the observation direction and the surface normal. Yeah. This is the angle between the lens normal and the object surface normal. 
So now we are ready to train a classifier. If we do it with classical classifiers, we find out that the SVM plus the quadratic kernel trick delivers the best performance, but we can also use neural networks. We will do both, and in both cases, we will acquire our data with the PMD Selenium module that we have introduced before. In both cases, we will consider five materials and use 30% of all the pixels for training and 70% for validation. And this is what we obtain for SVM, so an accuracy of 94%, very good classification. There are some uh, errors here, but uh, in the case of neural networks, the results are even better. They are actually uh, exhibiting a 95% accuracy, and they are uh, two orders of magnitude faster. Here are the two uh, confusion matrices. Uh, here we see the, the color of the white areas is slightly darker than here but in both cases it's a very good classification result. Now the question is, will this work in practice? So if we put all this, all this together in a camera, will it work in a real scene? For example, this one in which we have put together four of these uh, five different materials. Well, the answer is yes. On the top row, you will see the result for the SVM, for which we had to use a super pixel trick because the SVMs were really too slow to run in real time. And here in the second row, you see the result for neural networks uh, operating in a per pixel basis. So in both cases, very nice results. So as a conclusion, we have seen uh, that texture-based material classification relying on RGB images can be very easily fooled. And uh, fortunately, different materials exhibit rather different uh, light IRFs, so material-related IRFs. And these uh, MIRFs uh, can be used to generate feature vectors that can be used for material classification. And we have uh, demonstrated this MIRF-based per pixel and real-time material classification uh, using an um, off-the-shelf time-of-flight camera with Houston framework. So from my side, that's all. Thank you for your attention and do not miss our three-minute uh, demo of this camera.